There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey Twisters, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Twisted Philly. I am so looking forward to talking with you today. I mean, not like I'm not excited about talking with you every week, but this week I'm just even more excited. It's been a twisted week out here in Philly. On Wednesday, it was over 60 degrees, and then Thursday, we got four inches of snow. Now, I've been wishing we would get a decent snowstorm before the seasons change, and it was okay. It wasn't great. But four inches of snow is better than no snow. I liked the snow better than the 60 degrees. I have issues when seasons change unexpectedly. I want it to be winter while it's winter. And since we don't really seem to have a spring anymore out here in Pennsylvania, other than a few weeks of horrible pollen, which will be coming soon, I'll take the snow. Holy shit, I have so many what-ups this week. Yeah, it's my own fault. I skipped the traditional what-ups in the last two episodes, so I have a lot of catching up to do. Thank you to so many Twisted Philly listeners for your five-star reviews. What up to Aaliyah78? I've never read the Janet Ivanovich book series, but commenting that if a literary character had a podcast, it would be Twisted Philly, well, that just made my day. I'm a total book nerd and will definitely have to check out the series you mentioned. What up to Len138, who found me after my guest appearance with the amazing Women of Insight podcast, Thank you for jumping on over to Twisted Philly and giving me a listen. What up to Tisha B78, our 75th review. Congratulations to Twisted Philly, and thank you, Tisha. Your t-shirt is on the way. T. Oler and Scooter Fry, thank you both so much for listening and for taking the time to leave a review. What up to Virago Knits, thank you for your comments about the Ms. Rambo two-part episode. That was a tough story to tell, and I really appreciate your kind words. This episode is um, in a similar vein to that one, so I hope you enjoy it. And last but not least, what up to Jules B., who is listening in the Midwest. Twisted Philly is like a mini vacation to the East Coast. Okay, well, a weird mini vacation, but a mini vacation nonetheless. I have to give a huge ass Twisted Philly what up to Insight Podcast for having me on their show. It was an amazing experience. I loved sharing stories with Charlie and Allie. And I'm so grateful for the Insight listeners who have added Twisted Philly to their podcast repertoire. And I'd like to take a minute to give another what up to Irene Levy Baker, the author of 100 Things to Do in Philly Before You Die. A few of you have commented on social media how much you enjoyed that episode and you want to get Irene's book. If you order her book, make sure you go to Irene's website, 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia.com. You can include a note in your order, so in the comment section, make sure you mention you heard Irene on Twisted Philly, and she'll autograph your book for you. So what do we have in store this week? Over the past few months, some Twisted Philly listeners shared interest with me in a story about Pennsylvania's oldest female living inmate serving a life sentence, Lois for Carson. I knew a little about Lois's story and thought about including it sometime on the show this year. And then sadly, in early January, Lois passed away at the age of 91. One of our listeners, Anitra, shared the story of Lois's passing on the Twisted Philly Facebook page. And then after she posted that article, I received emails from even more listeners asking if I would share her story. Now, you guys know I cover stories that are of interest to me, whether they're true crime or bizarre stories like the episode about the three heads or cool places to visit in Philly. And they're stories that I hope will be interesting to you, too. Since launching Twisted Philly, I've had a few emails asking about story topics like Joseph Callinger, who I already covered, that was the creepy old man who lived in the shoe, the Philly Poison Ring, and Uncle Eddie, which I have scheduled later this spring. But after Anitra shared the story about Lois's passing, I received so many inquiries about her story. People wanted to know who she was and why she was sentenced to life in prison. And as is so often the case, as I get deep into research, I uncover so much more than I was expecting. Today, 
To tell Lois' story, I need to go back about 45 years to Philadelphia in the 70s. In 1973, the Environmental Protection Agency commissioned professional photographers to participate in a project they had. It was called Docu America. And it captured cities from all across the country, the good and the bad, the beauty and the plight. The images from Philly from that exhibit are powerful. There's pictures of children sitting on the stoop of a boarded up row home covered in graffiti and pictures of children playing in trash filled streets with abandoned cars parked nearby. There's images from the Ben Franklin Parkway and police on horseback mixed in with photographs of enormous piles of trash. Depending on the neighborhood, Philly in 1973 doesn't always look all that different from Philly today. Philadelphia was also known at that time for its crime families, like the mob was big in Philly. And in the 70s, the Philly mob was led by longtime boss Angelo Bruno. And that was sort of the heyday of the mob when they were super successful and nobody was running around killing each other. That lasted till the early 80s when Angelo Bruno was murdered. And that's a story for another day. The 70s were also a great time for the Philadelphia Flyers, one of the few Philly sports teams that I actually like. Now, back in the day, we used to call them the Broad Street Bullies because it was like you went to a fight and a Flyers game broke out. Our Bullies won the Stanley Cup two years in a row in 1974 and 1975, and they haven't done that again since. Although we've had a few appearances in the finals over the years, if that counts. And in the 70s, one of the city's largest employers was the Philadelphia State Hospital at Byberry. Now, that was a mental hospital that sat along the edge of the city, and it's a place that the locals just called Byberry. Byberry closed down in 1990 after operating for almost 80 years, but this place was so big, it was like a city in and of itself. It had its own post office, there was a farm, they had a bowling alley, um, but I think the bowling alley was after complaints in the 40s about horrific conditions for patients. In the mid to late 40s, the conditions at Byberry caught the attention of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. They were that bad. There was raw sewage in the hallways, which is kind of a nice way of saying human excrement. Patients were sleeping naked. They were huddled together in the hallways for warmth. The images from Byberry were so horrific, and they made it into Life magazine. The pictures were compared to the conditions at concentration camps. Like, that's our history at Philadelphia State Hospital. Like so many other state hospitals across our country, Byberry endured years of overcrowding, not enough staff, not enough beds. In the 60s, when it was at its fullest capacity, there were more than 6,000 patients and inmates calling Byberry home, even though the complaints of neglect continued well into the 80s. Even right up until Byberry closed in 1990, the hospital failed multiple state inspections. And like we talked about in the Ms. Rambo episodes, The state of mental health in this country was a nightmare in the 70s and 80s because of state hospitals and their conditions, and at the same time, because of the state hospitals closing. In some ways, it's just as bad today, certainly not with the horrific state hospitals, but there's so many mentally ill persons who don't get the help and resources they need because they don't know where to go or they can't afford it. In 1971, 45-year-old Dr. Lois Fikarsen worked as a psychiatrist at Byberry. She hadn't been working there very long or living in Philadelphia for very long either. Lois moved from New Jersey to Philly after 1969, where she'd been working at Ancora State Hospital in Hamilton. Why did she change jobs and move to a new city? For love. When she was working as a psychiatrist at Ancora, Lois was assigned a patient named Gloria Burnett. Gloria was a young woman in her early 30s, and she had a difficult history of emotional and mental health issues since she was a teenager. She'd been hospitalized multiple times since the age of 17, and her time at Ancora was another attempt to provide Gloria the mental health support she desperately needed. Gloria was Lois's patient at first, And then eventually she became her partner. After Gloria was released from the state hospital in Jersey, she and Lois maintained their connection. They stayed in touch. And what likely started as a friendship built on trust and a need for someone to understand eventually developed into a romantic relationship. Lois moved to Philadelphia and began working at the Philadelphia State Hospital at Byberry. 
She moved into Society Hill Towers in a neighborhood that was a seriously far cry from those haunting photographs of children playing in trash-ridden streets. And with her moved Gloria. Soon after Lois started working at Byberry, she helped Gloria secure a job there too, as an aide. And it would seem, at least for a while, that life was good for Lois and Gloria, living in Philadelphia. Like a lot of major urban cities, Philadelphia has a thriving LGBTQ community. That's not to say we don't have our share of hatred and intolerance, because we do, even now in 2017. In 2007, our former mayor, John Street, dedicated 36 Rainbow Street signs to honor the part of the city that we in Philadelphia affectionately call the Gaberhood. It's kind of the best part of the city, if you ask me. In the 90s, one of my favorite places to go in Philly was a bar called Hepburn's, and it was right in the heart of the Gaberhood. Philadelphia even held its very first gay pride parade in 1972. It was a march from Rittenhouse Square to Independence Hall, and there were about 10,000 people. So in the 70s, the city was definitely changing, and a big part of that was when Philly and New York and D.C. initiated Reminder Day on July 4th in 1965. And that was a way to remind everyone that gay men and women didn't possess the same rights as everyone else. Yeah, the city was changing, but not fast enough. In 1971, when Lois and Gloria lived together and worked together, there were people who took offense to them. These people found ways to demonstrate their offense so that they could hide their disdain for Lois and Gloria's life together. One of those people was a man named Dr. Leon Weingrad. He was a neighbor at Society Hill Towers, and he also worked at Byberry. So whether at home or at work, neither Lois nor Gloria could avoid the watchful eye of this guy. Not only did he work with Lois, but his office was across the hall from her at Byberry. Stories about Lois and Gloria made the rounds at their apartment complex and at Byberry Hospital. They were partiers. They experimented with drugs. Honestly, I think that was the culture of the 70s. I mean, okay, maybe not everyone was taking drugs, but if the rumors were true, so what? Some of the people spreading the rumors were probably partying and enjoying a joint and a drink now and again back then. And it's possible the rumor mill was running its mouth because people just weren't comfortable with a lesbian couple at the hospital or at their home. Weingrad wasn't content with simply sharing his discomfort about Lois and Gloria with them. He complained to the staff at Byberry about their relationship, and he complained about Lois. He told her boss that she was incompetent as a psychiatrist. There's nothing in the court records or news stories from the 70s to suggest Lois was anything but competent at her job, but it's the tale Weingrad told. Another tale about these three was that Gloria was having an affair with Weingrad. Again, that's suspect. Why the hell would she get involved with a man who seemed like he was out to get her and her partner? And they were lesbians. I don't know. I think back in the 70s, maybe some men just couldn't handle the fact that a woman might not be interested in them. By the summer of 71, the women had enough of Weingrad's nasty, demeaning comments. It had been a tough summer for many of the residents at Society Hill Towers because of a number of break-ins. Lois and Gloria had talked about getting a gun for protection, but never really did anything about it. Until Friday, August 27th, when Gloria used Lois's credentials to go out and buy a gun. And you know, it's 1971. You go and you get the gun the same day you show up. Just a few days later on Sunday, Dr. Weingrad was dead from three close-range gunshot wounds in the parking lot of Society Hill Towers. So what happened? Gloria Burnett happened. The disagreements between Gloria Lois and Weingrad weren't contained to their apartment complex or the privacy of the offices at Byberry. Weingrad's tires were slashed. Gloria Burnett was harassing him around Byberry, and eventually she was asked to resign, of course for which she blamed him. She was furious and talked to Lois about wanting to kill Leon Weingrad. Lois thought there had to be a better way to solve their issues, but Gloria was convinced killing him was the only option. Lois admitted to telling Gloria, you do whatever you feel you must. Now, that probably wasn't the best sentiment to share with someone who has a history of mental illness, is threatening to kill someone, and can get their hands on a gun. 
On Sunday, August 29th, Gloria Burnett showed up at Leon Weingrad's apartment where he lived with his wife and his two young children. She told him she needed medical treatment for a burn on her foot. Apparently, she burned her foot trying to start her car. And he treated her. Regardless of his feelings toward Gloria and Lois, he didn't turn Gloria away. Once he finished bandaging Gloria's foot, he left the apartment. He had a 24-hour shift as a police surgeon with the Philadelphia PD coming up. And it was as he was heading to his car across the parking lot that his fate was sealed. Multiple witnesses saw Gloria Burnett argue with Weingrad in the parking lot at Society Hill Towers. Some were actually in the parking lot standing nearby and heard them yelling at one another. Others saw this unfold from their apartment windows way above, but there were no less than seven people who witnessed the shooting. And unlike other stories that we might hear, true crime stories from the 70s, all of these witnesses came forward. They left their building to try to stop what was happening. Gloria shot Weingrad in the eye, the collarbone, and the chest. And then she ran and she fired her gun in Weingrad's direction as she tried to flee. A Society Hill Tower security guard fired his own gun towards her, but he fired it into the ground. He didn't want to hit her. He just wanted her to stop. And she did. Gloria surrendered her gun to Charles Cox, the guard, and waited with him for police to arrive. No one recalled seeing Lois for Carson because she wasn't there. Gloria Burnett acted alone. She pulled the trigger alone. She fired not one, but three times. There were reports that she not only slashed Dr. Weingrad's tires in the weeks leading up to his murder, but she smashed his car windows that same month. Yet, Dr. Lois for Carson is the one who was sentenced to life in prison. Yes, Pennsylvania's oldest female inmate serving a life term without the possibility of parole never actually committed murder. According to Gloria Burnett, who was questioned for eight hours by police the day of the shooting, Lois even told her killing Weingrad wasn't the solution. She told the police Lois had nothing to do with the murder. She acted completely on her own. But it was Lois who got life. And this is where I started uncovering a rabbit hole of information and appeals and emotion that I never expected. Gloria Burnett's initial statements were that she acted alone. Yes, she used Lois's physician credentials to purchase a gun. I mean, who's going to question a psychiatrist who says she wants a gun for home protection? In 1971, absolutely no one. Did Lois, as a physician, as a psychiatrist, have a moral or medical obligation to alert authorities about Gloria's intentions? I would say probably. Actually, I would say yes. I think she did. And I can't say why she didn't act, other than she probably didn't think Gloria would actually do something like this. Gloria Burnett was confined to Norristown State Hospital immediately after the shooting, and a competency hearing was held in late November that year. Regardless of her previous mental health history, she was found competent to stand trial. And initially, Gloria was the only one charged. Until 1973, over two years after the murder. Sure, the Philadelphia police questioned Lois when the murder happened, but based on Gloria's testimony, there was no reason to charge her. Dr. Lois Fakarson was only guilty of not reporting her partner's threats against another person. But then, during a pre-trial hearing in January 1973, Miss Gloria changed her tune. She testified that Lois encouraged her to kill Dr. Weingrad because she feared he would get her fired. As a result of this testimony, Lois was arrested, and she was charged with first-degree murder. Gloria spent about a year and a half in a mental institution. She was alone. She had no comfort. She had no company. And she had no word from Lois. Lois had disassociated herself from Gloria after this. And so Gloria started imagining the worst. Lois was ignoring her because she had other women or other partners, and Gloria got jealous, and she had these fantasies in her mind, and that's when she made a deal with the district attorney's office to testify against Lois in exchange for lesser charges and a lighter sentence. Once Lois Carson was in jail, Gloria began writing her, telling her how sorry she was for her testimony, telling Lois that she didn't really want to testify against her, but it was the only way Gloria could get her lighter sentence. Now, remember Gloria's original statement the day she was arrested. 
The day of the murder, even after eight hours of intense questioning, while the Philadelphia police pushed her to implicate Lois, Gloria's statement stayed the same. Lois had nothing to do with this crime. Gloria said she acted alone. So why would a jury buy what Gloria and the DA were selling? And just who was the DA on this case, or I should say assistant district attorney? It was powerhouse Lynn Abraham. If you know anything about Philly, you know the name Lynn Abraham. At the time of Lois's trial, she was the assistant district attorney. And DA Abraham painted Lois as a mastermind, as a puppeteer who manipulated a mentally ill woman to do her bidding. Lois, unfortunately, didn't show any regret over Dr. Weingrad's death, and it was her style and approach on the stand, plus Lynn Abraham's assistance, that Gloria could never have acted alone. The real monster was Lois. It was called vicarious liability. That's a term I'd never heard of before. It means the consequence of shared criminal intent and the existence of a conspiracy. It took a Philadelphia jury just two hours in March 1974 to find Lois guilty of murder and sentenced her to life in prison. Why not charge her with conspiracy to commit murder or manslaughter even? Because I think the DA and the prosecutor's office had it in for Lois. Yeah, that's me editorializing, as I sometimes do. But that's what I think. I think about the climate of Philadelphia. And even with our first Pride Parade, just a year after the murder, the city still wasn't entirely open to homosexuals. And I think in the 70s, lesbians had probably, you know, as tough a time as gay men. And then there's the stigma of Lois dating a former patient. Was that ethical? And if it wasn't, is that a reason to charge someone with murder when there's no proof of a conspiracy? Harold Stern was a renowned Philadelphia psychologist in the 80s, and he knew both these women. Uh, He'd actually worked with Lois at one time, and he was quoted as saying, the word of a criminal psychopath sent Lois to prison for life, and there's something wrong with that. He went on to say, it's very inequitable that the person who committed the crime has been proven to have been deranged before and after the event has been released while Lois has been so severely penalized. So what about this deranged person who committed the murder? What about Gloria? What was her fate? She testified against Lois during her trial in 1974 and was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but immediately Gloria was eligible for parole. So she served maybe three, three and a half years before being paroled in 74. But then she went back to jail three times for parole violations. And in the late 80s, she was being treated for mental health issues at Mayview State Hospital. Lois Vicarson was sent to Muncie Correctional Institute out near Pittsburgh, which is a shithole. No offense to the men and women who run the prison, but it's a depressing fucking place. And I don't know, maybe you think prison should be a depressing place. Sometimes I think prison should be a depressing place. But when I think of the 200 female inmates in Pennsylvania serving life sentences, And I think about the unique challenges and experiences that women have. I I guess I just wish there was something a little more for them than a shithole. This is a hard story to tell. I'm struggling to hold back how I feel because I'm not even 100% sure how I feel myself sometimes. It's almost like you have to evaluate every case and the reason why each of these women are serving life sentences. Do they all deserve something better than a dark, dank existence? Have they repented for their crimes? Are they remorseful? Was it a mistake? Was it an accident? There are women serving life sentences in Muncie for something they did when they were a teenager. And it was a horrible choice that they made at the time. And they spend the rest of their lives behind bars for making a mistake at 16. In 1976, Gloria Burnett recanted her testimony, again saying she only testified against Lois in an effort to get a lighter sentence, and that she made everything up about Lois knowing her intentions. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court refused to grant Lois Vicarson a new trial. In 1979, Lois was denied clemency. Lois was 48 when she went to prison, and for 15 years, she and her attorney submitted appeal after appeal, and each one was denied. John Alessandroni, Lois's attorney back in 1974, stuck with her through every appeal. Even he couldn't understand the first-degree murder charge and a sentence of life in prison. John thought at most Lois should have been charged with involuntary manslaughter, but she wasn't. 
she was charged with first-degree murder. In a 1989 phone interview, Lois Vicarson admitted that she owned some share of responsibility. She did say that she didn't instigate it, but she admitted that she could have done something when Burnett showed her a gun and told her her thoughts about wanting to kill Weingrad. I wouldn't say that Lois acted as a mastermind, and neither would she. What she did say was that she did nothing. She also said that she deeply regretted what happened. In that interview, Lois also said she regretted what happened to Leon Weingrad. She said she wished that she could get healing or forgiveness from his family. Regardless of everything that's happened, Lois said she felt that a life sentence may have been too much for what her role was in this crime and that she wanted another chance. In June of that same year, Harvey Bell, a pardons case specialist for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, served as Lois's pardon advocate for a hearing before the Board of Pardons on June 29th. Harvey was quoted as saying, this is a person who has demonstrated that she is not a risk to anyone at any time. If there is some way I can assist in giving her a positive future, I would like to do so. When Lynn Abraham, who by this time was Judge Abraham, was asked for her thoughts before Lois's first pardon hearing, she said that she had opposed petitions for clemency in the past and she would continue to do so. Abraham was quoted as saying, there's no reason why she should get clemency. She was the architect of this whole case. She was sentenced to life in prison and that is her sentence. And Lois was denied the pardon. She was 64 in 1989, and as recently as 2014, she was denied a pardon for a sixth and final time. At that point, Lois was 88 years old. She was constantly in the Muncie Infirmary, and then in February of 2016, she was moved to a facility with better care. But how could she possibly be a threat to anyone at 88 years old? I learned that she had a dear friend who wanted to care for her, and there was a home where she could be cared for. But three years later, just this past January, she passed away. She was 91. Lois was surrounded by other inmates who had become her friends, who cared for her both physically and in friendship. Again, I uncover facts and stories and emotions that I never expected. I went into this story when listeners were asking me to cover it, the story of Pennsylvania's oldest female inmate serving a life sentence, thinking, I remember reading about that psychiatrist from Society Hill, the one who convinced her girlfriend to kill their neighbor. And just like the story of Sylvia Segrist, I realized I'm blind to what's really going on. I'm blind to the details behind the headlines. I'm blind to the plight of women in prison in Pennsylvania. And I'm blind to the number of elderly inmates in our state. While she was in prison, although Lois lost her license to practice psychiatry, she helped other inmates with social service programs. And if she had been paroled, her plan was to help women in the community. She led the prison choir and worked in the prison law library. She received Inmate of the Year many times, and she cultivated lifelong friendships. Gloria Burnett, on the other hand, who was out of prison and mental hospitals, was busy threatening D.A. Lynn Abraham in the 90s. Again, which one of these women really belonged in prison? Through my research of Lois Vicarson's story, I learned about an organization in Pennsylvania, the Fight for Lifers. Fight for Lifers is basically a program dedicated to reconstruction that addresses the concept of life without the possibility of parole for both men and women in the state of Pennsylvania. This group has seven areas of focus to support inmates serving life sentences. Commutation, juvenile life without parole, the Post-Conviction Relief Act, women's lifers, compassionate release for the terminally ill, which if you're like me, you might be thinking, well, why wasn't Lois eligible for compassionate release? Well, because she wasn't terminally ill. She was just really old and suffering from conditions that affect all Americans in advanced old age. But technically, that's not the same as being terminally ill. The Fight for Lifers also focus on elderly lifers and the mentally ill. I didn't know Pennsylvania has the second highest number of elderly incarcerated persons in the entire country, but we do. 
In the 80s, there were just about 370 elderly persons incarcerated. And today, there are over 8,000 in Pennsylvania prisons. And let's talk about people suffering from mental illness for a minute. Because after all the mental health institutions went under, men, women, children even with mental illness ran the risk of becoming criminalized. Where could they go? Could their family afford private care? Can they be forced to take their medication? Today, 73% of all women at Muncie, which is our state correctional institution in Pennsylvania for female prisoners, have some form of mental illness. 73%. You know that's an underlying contributor to their crimes. I needed to learn more about the fight for lifers. And as so often happens, I found someone to talk with. She's an amazing woman named Ellen from Bucks County who not only opened my eyes to so many issues in our prison system in Pennsylvania, she's a badass. We must have spent an hour or more on the phone while she educated me and shared so much about her work and that of both Reconstruction Inc. and the Fight for Lifers. And then we talked shop, mom shop and girl talk. She married a musician. I married a musician. She's still married to hers. I divorced mine. We both agreed there's a podcast in there somewhere. We each have 16-year-old kids, great kids, and I'm going to be seeing her soon because I want to volunteer for this organization. So this episode is part one of Lois for Carson's story. Part two will go deeper into the challenges female prisoners face when looking down the barrel of a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I'll share so much of my conversation with Ellen, and I may just have another story to share from someone who knew Lois very well. I don't know what your thoughts are on life sentences. I'm torn. I think of what happened to Grace Packer and of her murderers, actually, her torturers. And I'm filled with anger, and I think people like that absolutely deserve a life sentence, if not something worse. And then I think about Lois Carson's story, and I think she got a shit deal. She didn't deserve life in prison. She didn't deserve to be denied appeals or clemency or pardons for over 40 years over and over again. And I get that you may not agree with me. And I appreciate you listening anyway. So I hope you'll come back for part two of this story. In the meantime, I would like to thank singer-songwriter Emmy Sarah for the music in this episode. You can find out more about Emmy and her music on her website, emmysarah.com. That's E-M-M-Y-C-E-R-R-A dot com. And you can download her music on iTunes. I also want to put in a shameless plug for CrimeCon before I go. Look, I get it. A true crime convention may not be in your budget. A cruise isn't in my budget. It's all about choices. We each make choices that fit our budgets, fit our families, fit our lives. Okay, sometimes I choose fancy shoes that don't really fit into my budget, but you just have to treat yourself. But if CrimeCon is a choice you can make, I've got a discount code for you, and I want you to order your tickets before February 28th because ticket prices go up at the end of the month. You can use code TWISTED20 and get 20% off your registration. This weekend is going to be epic, and not just because of big-name people like Nancy Grace and F. Lee Bailey, although that is seriously cool. For me, it's a chance to meet some of you the people that keep me and Twisted Philly going, the listeners. I want to meet you so I can say thank you to your face and, of course, so I can say, what up? And I've been reading true crime stories since long before podcasts were ever a pipe dream. I mean, weren't you, like, stealing Anne Rule novels from your mom or your grandmom's bedside table? Actually, I didn't do that. My mom never read Anne Rule. She didn't like anything scary. I think I got them from the library. If you can go, great. Like I said, I've got a code that will help you save money. And if you can't, that's okay too. We are going to post tons of pictures. And by we, I mean me and all of the other awesome podcasters that are going to be there. And you know I'll be talking about it on Twisted Philly. That's it from me. I can't wait to talk to you for part two. Ciao for now, Twisters.